Well, everybody, welcome to DEF CON 864, the local DEF CON group. I'm Overcast on the Discords. Tonight we're going to talk about cloud security. Not trying to rehash all the different aspects of what cloud could be, but just to give a good general baseline understanding of what cloud computing really is. There's the old adage of it's just somebody else's computer running somebody somewhere else that you're going to use as a reason. Realistically, I mean, you want to talk about compliance and other things. There's a lot of legal matters that have to go into play when any organization signs a contract to, to have that kind of cloud computing. As, as typical people in the world, though, we tend to just sign up for a cloud service, whether it's Apple, Facebook, or anything else, and just start dumping our data in it as quickly as possible. I think we should definitely have a conversation around that. I mean, the privacy battle between Facebook and Apple has been heating up over the recent months, but some of that's marketing and branding posturing and the rest of it could actually be pretty beneficial there. So uh, any, any thoughts and questions around cloud computing as a buzzword? or as an industry term you guys want to dig into there? We were kind of chattering back and forth about it before we started recording, but I think the biggest problem is too many people go at it and see it as the panacea, you know, or else it is the big fear point. You know, heaven help that we move anything out into the cloud and, and it exists out there. But you really have to look at it for the application, for the situation, for how it's going to be used, because there are a lot of things that the cloud really gives you great benefit for. But you have to remember, if you're going to put it out there, you're going to have to take the time to protect it. And that's many times where people fall short is they stick it out there and they just depend that, well, Google said it's safe or Microsoft said it's safe or whoever says it's safe. Um, you've got to take the time to defend it and protect it. And if you don't, you know, you're just asking for trouble down the road somewhere. And I think it's important, especially like with AWS and stuff, you it's important that you talk to them and understand what's theirs and what's not, so you know what to, you know, what to protect. And, okay. I think that was the, the big issue with the early adopters. They jumped in, they saw all the certifications, the ISOs, the, the SOC 2, SOC 1, and they thought, oh great, they're secure, I'm perfectly fine, start. Yep. And, and they feel that that's, that was enough that they feel that they could simply rely on Amazon, they could rely on Microsoft, Google, whoever's hosting it, and, and call it a day. Turns out that wasn't the case. Well, and they're and approved third-party vendors. That's exactly you know, what I was going to say. That's the big thing we fight with Microsoft is these, you know, people will go to our conference and they'll come back and, oh, we want to integrate such and such and so and so into our into our Exchange client, and oh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Turn it on and. So then we go out and look at the, you know, terms of service and privacy, and you go like, oh, we're going to turn this on, and you have access to our whole client to harvest out of our client whatever you want to harvest. And so we'll call them up and say, yeah, no, we're not approving that. Yeah. But we've been using it for two years yep. already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what you've been doing with in it. In that booth on the show floor, <laughs> Microsoft was like, we can absolutely integrate with that. Yes. Here's how you're going to do it. Yes. We'll get an integrator to contact yes. you. And Yes, yeah, because a lot of people just don't look at, they, they go to the, they see the approved third party and they just start running them. Or, you know, I was talking to so-and-so and so-and-so at Verizon says this is the greatest thing to use, so we just need to turn this on for us. Well, Verizon may think it's really great because Verizon has put all the protections in place to make it work, but we don't have time to do it, so we ain't putting it in place, sorry. And, and that's, you know, again, it's part of that, People either think, oh, I'm protected because Microsoft says they, they're protected, so I'm protected, or, you know, it's just this is just going to fix my problem so I can share all my files with all my employees who are spread all over everywhere, and so I'll just stuff everything out there. One of the things that I see a lot with the different SaaS vendors that tend to come through or they try to come through is when we ask them for their SOC 2 Type 2 or their, you know, FedRAMP or anything else like that, they always lead the case that, well, we're a sub of Amazon and they meet it so they basically they just throw their hands up and just say because they've met it we're going to meet it inherently mm -hmm. and it that that definitely so doesn't work. work I mean yeah. you want to talk about backdoors I mean you can software engineer your way into some pretty bad situations there so mm -hmm. we just got started yeah. welcome guys yeah, yeah. we're a few minutes late no, that's we're always yeah. starting a few minutes late so perfect yeah just wanted to fit in. If you get another call, let me know. I'll grab the next. 
backdoors happen when you use software developers that don't pay them or treat them well enough to make them part of the company to make them feel like that they've got ownership. If you use people and throw them away, yep. then your end product is going to be shit. And unfortunately, we live in a world now where everybody wants to pay the lowest possible price for it. Right. Or like they said in Armageddon, you're sitting on a ship made of 10,000 parts, all, all sold by the lowest bidder. How does that make you feel? And there goes the entire internet. But as long as our business is operational, everything's fine, right? Yeah, but they're not anymore, are they? And the impact that the cloud is having on people. One of the things we were talking about earlier, um, before we got started, Kurt was mentioning, we, can talk, we were talking about once a business starts pushing all their eggs in that basket out on the cloud, you talk about a, you know, a, an adversary who brings that whole cloud piece down, and there have been times where there's been service interruptions, um, but never the full effect or data loss requiring that to, to be rolled back in any way. Um, that would have a huge impact on many different businesses. Well, um, what we talk Google, about specific, Google Cloud went down for. A while, I don't know, like a year or so ago, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. Well, I mean, the internet routers have been hacked already and shut down, and they yeah. did have to shut those down, reboot them, reload them with new firmware, and then bring them back up and build the routing table. So you want to tell me the cloud hasn't been affected in that way? I call bullshit. <laughs> there is no cloud, there is only somebody else's computer. My dad was working in the cloud for IBM 50 years ago. It was called a mainframe. And as soon as you could dial into it, it's a remote computer system with remote control access. Just a question of the speed. That's all it is. But then again, back in his day, you were only storing 10K. <laughs> so, yeah. And using your green screen. In a room this size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a lot of AC. You know, so the game changes, but it all stays the same. The fundamentals of computing haven't changed much since you know Linda Lovelace started writing her first code. Well, I think the difference is the volume of use, you know, like oh, the so fact I that every think, business yeah. is now on the cloud while back in those days a, the general public only public certain public. industries yeah. used that mm -hmm. that yeah. mainframe cloud. It was only you're right, it was the big supermarkets, the banks, mm -hmm. people that had to control a lot of data that just was an enormous task every other way. But yeah now, as you say, everybody's doing it, even down to an individual that's running his business with him alone as, as you know, got your own computer with QuickBooks on it. You're now doing effectively cloud computing. Mm -hmm. As you're communicating with, Bit, uh, with QuickBooks, you're probably storing a backup of your QuickBooks uh, files with, with them online. Yeah. Other than the intermittent outages due to misconfigurations that we're seeing. I can't think of the last major cloud service provider outage based on either based on either malicious means or misconfiguration. Particularly well, data took out the whole exchange, uh, where was it, in Texas or No, no, it was in this country. Oh, okay. They set a bomb off and it was right, now. whether it was deliberate, oh, that it was, was right next to the AT&T main Nashville. switching, but it shut yeah, down downtown um, Nashville. Tennessee. Yeah, that, it was in Nashville. Yes. Yeah, that shut down quite a bit of the internet <laughs> for a uh, while. <laughs> but that's not necessarily cloud provider, and that would be more of a physical attack, I would call it. Yeah, I mean, it's still to find a cloud provider as if it's the physical storage or the medium through which it travels. Both of that that impacted AT and T. I consider that location in particular not a cloud service provider location, more of a data transit point. Right. And it affected a lot of companies who moved data through that area, mm -hmm. certainly, but it didn't really affect processing or or storage capability for for many organizations. Definitely has an impact. Yeah. Last one I think of is when uh, Microsoft had that data center with the AC issue and everything overheated, and mm -hmm. their whole system went offline. Because you know, was that pretty recent? Um, it was long, early. Let's, let me think here. Was that? I remember that was 29. I think later 20, 2019. I remember something maybe a month or two ago. Uh, it did affect O365 and Outlook and or Outlook. Oh, that that's just because Microsoft pushes up. Microsoft pushed an update recently. They right. crashed a bunch of their Exchange servers right. and their what was it? it? Was a portion of the back end routing between the Exchange servers and Azure AD that got crashed because of a patch update. 
right. but they then had to go back and pull because back. That, yeah, because that's so. a massive uh, email <laughs> breach that affected something like three and a half thousand companies that had their yeah. mail servers infected. And I remember maybe a year or two ago, AWS had an issue with a, a failover misconfiguration, and they lost a good portion of East Coast. Network. So it makes you think when you spin up cloud services, you have to think about geography as well, because when mm -hmm. cloud providers start screwing with your stuff, then they may pull the rug out of under you, so to say. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things about, you should always have two copies of it in two physically different, you know, time zones, potentially. Oh, yeah. But the, the other thing that worries me, and I, I've suffered data loss partly through my own fault, um, and then tried to get it recovered, and what you find out is that a lot of these companies are not doing any kind of cold backup. So if it happens and the data is deleted and it's deleted properly, it's deleted off of all copies and you can't get it back. You don't do it. You know, they don't have a, uh, the old style backup to take, you know, because there's yeah. too much data. It has to be backed up to hard drive. And at no time do they go, okay, this is a snapshot in time. We'll take any hard drives out and put them on the shelf and that will be a, a restore point if anything gets wiped. So you could wipe an entire data center or encrypt an entire data center and whatever happens on one copy happens on the backup. That's the link. And that's, that's a concern. That's why it's good to have uh, monitoring for rapid changes across many files. <laughs> yeah, that was great. That's exactly what SolarWinds software is supposed to do. And it was the freaking Trojan horse that came in and caused the problem <laughs> through, a, through a patch that was <laughs> pushed Onto the product. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I don't think you're talking about uh, not recalling any major cloud provider outages. Uh, but I wouldn't, outside of like ransomware attacks, I wouldn't see it as big a motive towards causing an outage for like a cloud provider um, from like a criminal organization standpoint. The, the yeah, level of actor it would take to yeah. hack Amazon, they don't want to take down, you know, the coffee shop's Office 365. I yeah, think what's the motive and what's the game is the question, isn't it? So I would imagine just like data stealing is yeah, probably get, a much more common But then you've got to look attack. at things like when you're getting into nation states, hacking, as if it's like just spying. That's the problem. There's no code of conduct for governments anymore who are doing this? There, there are a few things that we, I think, need to go into. And we can talk about like AWS and, and open and public buckets and things like that, which are, I think are a bit detailed. We can talk about zero trust security. And a lot of that is more of the architecture level discussions about cloud security. Maybe we, we should dive into that for a little bit. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. So zero trust security, if we step up at the high level when we talk, talk about compliance and architectures, that zero trust security is I think a beautiful model that we have today as opposed to the older school model of looking at a perimeter and saying, no, that's that's our field. That's where we live. But instead, we're stepping back, and this is very much a dumbed-down version of it. I'd love to kick around your thoughts on zero trust um, architecture, uh, where you're looking at every endpoint as a subject. You're looking at every resource you have in the organization, and you're saying the policy between those two is what the control point is. The only trust point is between policy and resource. It's no longer between devices, routers, any type of a physical perimeter that we have anymore. So, so in that basically sense, you make each each process, each person, it's an object. So it's like it's like when you had object orientating coding, but at a bigger system level. Much bigger system, it's, yeah. So the interconnects have to be strictly defined and then... For the policy that controls those yeah. interconnections, right? Like anybody can reach, for example, like even the GovCloud pieces of these services are on the public internet that you can reach the front ends for them but it's your access, authentication, and authorization, and then the policies wrapping behind that that kicks right. in. So go back into your, going back to your point, a lot of this, I mean, I remember way back in the day, like as we moved through virtualization that was coming out of some of the, you know, the old school gray beards that were handing the reins off to me as I was coming in as a sysadmin and we're saying, your LPAR virtualization and IBM, no, that's not new. We've been doing that for, you know, 20 years, right? And even today when we talk about whether it's VMware or any other cloud-based virtualization service, there's always that underpinning that fits. But I think there's an abstraction layer that when we can think and talk about it, maybe it becomes a bit more helpful to the business uh, to help us win our case instead of speaking more of the technological 
underpinning and pieces for this. Just want to know your thoughts on that zero trust architecture and. So so uh, I'm not as familiar with AWS as Azure, um, but Azure for zero trust um, and just to your point, the abstraction, right? It's so much easier to micro segment everything and then manage the permissions to all those items at scale through automated processes compared to, uh, you know, in VMware as an example, right? If I want to find out who had a public IP address, you know, I'd have to search a string for something that, you know, maybe wasn't an internal IP address or, you know, how was I going to find that out? Whereas in a cloud, right, I just so show me the public IP addresses and now I know whether it's, what they're connected to. And, okay, what are the, what's, you know, follow down that. Um, so checking that's a lot easier in the cloud, right? Like, because everything is abstracted. And so it's so much easier to look at, you know, a data bucket versus, you know, a SQL server um, or a hard drive connected to a computer um, and being able to run scripts to be able to say, hey, is the disk encrypted or not? Um, I definitely think that it's a lot easier to do zero trust in the cloud compared to if I had to try and do that in the data center. <laughs> that takes a lot. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have to have all that, I have to have additional uh, reporting or some sort of agent running on everything. And then I've got to have some sort of scaled switching architecture like uh, Cisco ACI. That's that that because do. the communication of, of what data can pass through the cloud is much more controllable. Is that, is that the way you... Yeah, exactly. It? Because, it's, for instance, if I have a VM on an ESXi <coughs> server that's doing... Uh, oh, gosh, it's been a while. But the, the distribution where it could move from a different server to another server... Be motion. Load, it's not be motion. Uh, yeah, but there's the, it's like there's a load balance to be motion almost. Like, it'll yeah, actually sure. automatically move it. Uh, right. But I forget what it's called. But anyways... Um, it's going to start with a V, whatever you're Yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> V-motion. Uh, so, you know, in order to do that, right, like, I'd have to have some sort of rule set that said, hey, you know, this VM is only allowed on this VLAN, and by the way, it might not be on this server on this port, it might be on this server on this port, and i got to be able to have something that's, you know, tracking all that and keeping that up to date, otherwise, you know, that's just... And then you got to manage change control. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But whereas with Taking a Taking all that on, on your own internally... No. We've already proven we don't do that well. We don't do that well. So to, to your point of like Azure and even AWS, to, to like already start further down the road on that, it's a huge win for a lot of businesses. Well, well the solved right is in DB, right? Oh, yeah. I have a change management database. I have a, a, a list of everything in my environment. The only thing that doesn't give me a software on the box. Well, that's where SolarWinds comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so the zero trust model, um, I don't know if that's a specific term. I'm, I'm not sys admin. Uh, ironically, kind of on the other side. Um, like, so we're going to wake security and we make a like security analysis portal. Uh, so the tools that a security team would use. Okay. Um, and, but, and then I'm on the cloud team for that product just to move it to the cloud. So really. But um, so is the zero trust it doesn't sound much different than just like a model of least privilege for everything. It takes that into consideration, but zero trust architecture is, is a truly a conceptual way of looking at it. It does have tenants or principles. I don't like that they use the word tenants because they're really <laughs> talking about principles, but they really speak to like these are good things to have. In, in order to maintain this kind of idea towards a zero trust architecture, you, keep, you maintain these principles. So it's really, there's a really, and I'll post it in the, in our, um, <laughs> I'll post it on our, uh, on the Discord, but NIST actually has a really good, it's a pretty short publication from NIST. It's only, I think, like 50 pages or so, but it, it just goes through what zero trust architecture is. Um, but it's a very high level discussion point. So if you have that in mind, it's a really good frame of reference as you're looking at more of a, a hands-on, detailed view of like trying to figure out every every component behind that one marketing branded Azure application, right? Because once you poke in, poke into Azure, you're no longer just using that one little thing you thought you took on. There's always like ten to twenty behind it. I mean, why can't you blacklist everything and then slowly let every, one app at a time be whitelisted and after it's been carefully reviewed? You could <laughs> until no. the next time they update it. Yeah, right. you have to start over. Yep. Well, the other thing is that. 
yeah. you, you know, whitelist something because it's needed at one point, but later it's not needed, but it's right. still whitelisted. And yeah. so, and you, you, you forget about it. You don't realize it's even there. Because it has to be maintained. And there is, yeah. there's a, you, you always want to do more, a whitelist. If you're going to do one, you want to do a whitelist as opposed right. to a blacklist because maintaining the blacklist is you're basically trying to be Google for everything that's potentially out there or inside, right? But it's a, it's an administrative yeah. crazy We've done banana pants. Any process that you try and put in place will only be successful if there's a reward for adhering to it or a consequence for breaking it. This is a mess. We've got to be able to do better than this. And so they've you know, sat down, they, they now understand the challenges because they've lived with them. It's like, how do we make this so that we don't have to do all that? Mm. So it's not going to be perfect. Nothing ever is, but it's got to be infinitely better. And again, it's a question of spending enough money that you have something better that is more secure. There's no such thing as completely secure, but it's the old story, Reasonable. like, you you know, you're on the savannah and there's a lion. You don't have to be, you don't have to outrun the lion. I just got to be quicker than the guy next to me, you know? You just got to be not the easiest, the easy, you don't want to be the richest, easiest target. You want somebody with more money that can be extorted out of them with lower security than you. That's, you know, ultimately you should be all gone. And that's an interesting <laughs> risk with the cloud, right? Because you don't have a physical location that everything's out there and so the more data you got exposed the more appealing you are. Yes. yes, which is why I was talking about some of this stuff should never be accessible. Yeah. And, and, and somebody should have to the door, door open it minus. and then almost like a missile silo, two of you have to do a button, you know. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, we're joking about some of this stuff but some of this stuff It's been solved before. Is, you know, is that important? That yes, it's costly to do that but the consequences of not having that level of security, if this was ever breached, is unimaginable. So yes, we're going to put ridiculous security in place. No, it's not going to be convenient by design. And those are questions that people aren't asking yet, but they need to start asking those questions. Some of the stuff, unfortunately, has to be online because the whole nature of the world is the customer's databases is online because they're the ones logging in and making the orders. And you can't take that offline. Well, it's also going to get cheaper, right? Like for a small company. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was just testing mm -hmm. Azure VPN, and, you know, that's way cheaper than you have to buy a firewall. <laughs> like I can spin up a remote VPN for four bucks a day. And probably a hell of a lot more secure, and, and the performance of it will be much better as well. With right. more eyes because behind the scenes on it than you could ever you're hire. Effectively, you're oh, totally. But, and then that, but that, that's, again, where the cloud becomes a lot more dangerous because there is no four walls. There yeah. is no nothing guarding it. So it's only secure as I think to your point of like open buckets or open shares. Uh, and being able to figure out if some other person in your organization created it. Like not even if you like, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, we have a good change management process for controlling what buckets. Oh, oh wait a minute. That person just created yeah. a free account on such and such a platform yeah. and is now shoveling test yeah. data out there that turns out to be a copy of fraud. Like well, That user has a drop personal Dropbox yeah. account and they're sharing it with their grandchildren and their nephew. What in the world? You know? Because no, uh, they just don't, well, they don't think. The right. average user doesn't think about that. Oh, this is just, it's just a spreadsheet with some stuff that I use. You know, nobody's going to care. They just won't do the you know, they Yeah, do yeah. That joke well. and, and then we no. have to go back and try to fight with them and go, okay, you know, we're shutting off Dropbox. You can't use Dropbox anymore. Ultimately, the feds came to us and said, guess what? <laughs> You've got to meet the following <laughs> compliance yep. level. Right, so that's what really did it. You know, <laughs> for us, that's been the greatest thing that's helped me. And, but we still fight, you know, because every year, the Requirements are getting are getting stricter. I, I think talking about, you know, I think that's where, honestly, knowing how to put the proper detection in place. Yeah. Especially like in AWS, you know, that's what we use. There's really good means to know <laughs> what's happening where, you know, if somebody creates a an account that shouldn't have the detection in place where you know, hey, yeah. And I know from, especially like the S3 bucket stuff, um, initially when they first started, AWS was open everything. So you created an even, you know, EC2 instance, run the gamut. By default. By default. Now, they've enabled encryption and everything right off the get-go. Which is good. Which is good by which, default, which, yeah. which is good, good for them. Yeah. It took them a little while, but good. 
Um, but just knowing what to look for and setting that in place. Uh, up front. Given what we just said about these sophisticated hacks kind of starting months ago, you probably felt the probes and, and then shut shut them down. Absolutely. So you're probably right. Detection is better than quote security. Or it's a part of security, but mm -hmm. if you know somebody is coming at you, you can get ready for it, and you can shut down some of the portcullises and things to. Absolutely. And also, if they do get in, yeah. shut it down before it encrypts the whole data in that network, because it takes some time to do all this stuff. At least shut it down so you can control the damage. Yeah, you know, yeah. At that point, you damage control mode, but if you didn't know it was even happening because you weren't exactly. detecting. Exactly. The other connected piece of this cloud model that we're all buying into here is even if, even if our employees are not clicking the links or answering the phones or doing those things, we all have subs and suppliers and, and third-party connections yeah. and yeah. B2Bs and all these other things that our legacy lay in so I think well, that was the biggest thing from the solar wind tech is that people need to take supply chain security a lot right. more seriously. Well and we have apps that we bought from Microsoft or that we bought from Symantec, but they're farming it out yeah. to you know five different yeah. third party companies stacked three deep to actually write the code and run it or do whatever the back end is and, and we take the tack of, well, I bought it from Microsoft, so you know, up, we're good. We're good. Yeah. And you know, that's one of the things the feds are starting to force on us, is that we, we as a university are going to start being required to do yearly data security audits of every vendor that we have to keep up just getting financial aid. Because, and, and you know, right? yeah. well, quality stands you know, and, within, you know, within but, system and then, developments. You know, no idea. So they're changing it though. They're taking it from just the hey, fill this out and send it back to me, to I have to get online with these people, talk with them, and you got to show me the reports you're building. Your you know, yeah. you're answering the answers, but you have to show me what you're building it from. It is a so long I can look at process. it. It is it is a huge process. Yeah, last and, time I did this one you know, video, that was it was the send the questionnaire and fill it out and send it back. Yeah, but yeah. it sounds more like an actual like, PCI. Yeah, well, they've, <laughs> taken to, they've taken they've taken they're they're working really hard from the Fed point of view, to take student financial aid level data and put it as close to DOD level data compliance as they can without the true force of DOD level. But their carrot is, you're going to do what we tell you to do, or we're not giving you financial aid. And so, you know, the schools are kind of like, okay, you know, we have so to make a vested interest you, in making you know, sure you never school, reach that standard. So, you know... Yeah, well, yeah, and, it, so, and we know that. And most of their standard is still government, so it's still paperwork. It is. You know, I may not be actually doing it, but if I've got paperwork that says I did it, then, you know, that's good enough for me you did it. So, you know, there's still that catch-22 of anybody can write on the paper, yeah, okay, we investigated this log, oh, we looked at this thing, oh, we did this, and you're really not. Or yeah, I have like I have product XYZ uh, that watches all these logs genome. for me and sends me alerts so I can check off on the fact that I've looked them over. You know, we got to be really careful that as security people, automation doesn't become our fix. Automation is just our assistant. Mm -hmm. And we're still taking the time, not necessarily every day, but we're periodically going back and reviewing, hey, this automated system that's looking at this, is it finding everything? Is it seeing everything that I would expect it to see? Do I need to go adjust the parameters? Um, Microsoft is bad about that. Microsoft will go turn on something with Microsoft. Microsoft says, hey, turn this thing on. And so we'll go turn it on. Enjoy this new dashboard, by the way. And, yeah, don't, don't, don't take me there. <laughs> and, then two weeks, and then two weeks later, it just stops working. And so you call up Microsoft. Hey, this thing's not working. Oh, you must have turned something off. Mm. No, because no, I didn't turn anything off. Because when I go in here into your interface, it says it's on. But when I go over here to your report manager, it says you don't have any data for this. And that's again that struggle. We get too easily stuck on well the automated system yeah, and it hasn't sent something. me a warning in three weeks, so everything must be good. And mm -hmm. We just have to continue with Microsoft, especially. There's well, a whole bunch of areas I have to go back and check like every week and a half or two what just to make sure they haven't changed them. Yeah. I'll just say, you know, from the automation standpoint, there's the obvious one-man shows. Yes. So when it comes to stuff like that, I mean, you have no choice. Right. Right. 
But again, I have to be really careful that I don't go, oh, well, I've got this auditing software that's telling me this, so I can just trust that what it's telling me is what's really going on. Well, and it's twofold, right? Because it's, it's that, but it's also knowing, do I have the skill set to actually do this myself? Yes. And so... You yeah. got to know your limits. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, right. skill set, time... Who's you watching know, the watches? Because exactly. most of us who are one-man shops understand. also have three, <laughs> yeah. three or four other jobs that we do besides... <laughs> Besides Absolutely. the data security. So, so something's so, going to fall off you know, along the way. Yeah. So, you know, how, how much, what percentage of my week is going to be data security? security the, you know, and, and it does sometimes. I've met that standard because I told you I have. Okay, that's right. right. So that's like, you're going to see the, uh, the new documentary about the uh, fishing. But bottom line is, uh, when you get these cans of tuna that says dolphin-friendly tuna, it turns out, to get that certification, what you have to do is you go to the boat captain and go, did you catch any dolphin today? And he goes, no. And then he goes, oh, congratulations. You can buy our dolphin-friendly tuna logo for this month for $5,000. And he goes, all right. <laughs> and that's the yeah. system. Or that gets you the label dolphin-friendly <laughs> tuna. The dolphin-friendly net. Did he catch any <laughs> dolphins? <laughs> yes. Dolphin-friendly <laughs> <laughs> net. <laughs> but he didn't say he did, so he didn't. <laughs> Yeah. Trust but verify. <laughs> well, my favorite one, you know, there's a certain number of bug parts that are allowed in your cereal yes. and still have it pass and be yes. called, you know, fit for human consumption. Okay, who oh, sets yeah. that standard? You know? So we've already started down the road of discussing the differences between compliance and security yes. and now touching on attestation of that compliance and some of the conflicts of I still have to attest myself. I'm a third-party person that that I'm maintaining my status, whether it's with, you know, DoD, FEMA, DOE, you know, right. education, whoever it is, we have to do that and maintain. So I'm dropping security off my radar, but my compliance is showing that I'm secure. I'm using air quotes way too much tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna pull it back oh, here a little yeah, bit. Answer. <laughs> but, but what are your thoughts around that that difficulty there in the balancing act between maintaining compliance yourself and for your subs? And that's and what security. I'm to. Okay. I'll, tell what did, I'll tell you what did work very well. Is that a very, coin rolling around in your finger there? What did work very well is when they passed the law that said the uh, financial director of any company is liable for any yes. financial irregularities regardless of who actually made them. The buck stops at him and he goes to jail if you find out there's been financial fraud that's reported on their quarterly uh, financial reports and also like data retention the fact that that's considered absolutely uh, a legal requirement that got serious really fast because people again are held consequent there's real consequences to people with job titles and they're and they're you know they've got seriously big business cards they're high up in the food chain and so they realize that you know they're they're vulnerable uh, and they're vulnerable because of the people underneath them, which they, I mean, they need those people to be honest about stuff, or if they're not, the person that's going in clink is them, or, you know, personal f liability fines and things. So, you know, if we're going to have that kind of verification, there's got to be consequences when it's not, you know, and, 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 and it won't happen until you make an example out of yeah, people. Yeah, I think the pig back off. Heads on pikes is very effective. <laughs> Oh, I'm back on. Metaphorically. There has to be a gradient between there and Pikes. I mean, like a dollar maybe, and then we'll do work for the British Empire for 500 years. I think the wrong did a pretty good job. Yes, yes. Works. it gets exciting really fast. Yeah. So that's where your model of your company, I think, has got more legs on it in that if you outsource, first of all, you know, with the Zur and, and um, with the... Uh, Amazon system, they have your data, so they're really in charge of, of, of protecting it to some extent. It's on their service. So all the security and all of the job of monitoring for these attacks, they've got the scale to have people that do that. Well, when you've got 10,000 companies using your system, they're probably being attacked hundreds of times a day, okay? So now you've got, you know, 200 people working for you and the attack log comes in and goes, this has happened to here. You've got somebody that can jump on it right now and react to it. And they're doing that all the time. So they're not getting bored, not getting complacent. Yeah. 
the, you know, and it's keeping them on the bleeding edge of what yeah, keeps them on the bleeding them. edge, and and that's their speciality. And I think that's probably what we're going to have to take more seriously. In this, is that security is so complicated and big that an outsourced major operation is probably the way to go. So you outsource your security to to Amazon, to MSPs, to Microsoft, to yeah, uh, um, yeah. Who's the one? Yeah. 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 There was a security company set up by a couple of guys that were used to work for the government, and they went private about five or six years ago, and their stock went up, and then it crashed. What they call it? We work. <laughs> How ironic that that kind of security letdown is exactly the sort of national security problem we've got where our own security groups like the FBI and CIA do not communicate with each other effectively. They each have their own information and then aren't passing it between each other. And what you're describing is exactly that situation that us the network is on. And their yeah. policy says that they can't, right? Yeah. Your own security could become... No but I can see them getting forced into an ISAC where they're forced to share, even if it's somewhat redacted information between them. Yes, but the government will always redact the one thing that's really important <laughs> out of the whole document. Yeah, the and it, it isn't secret, it isn't anything else. It's just that I want to screw you, so I'm going to redact this one little piece of information that is going to be the key so that you have to come back to me that's the to, IOC that you to need. get it. Well, there are security products that are multi cloud right. that will. You know, right. look at your, your GCP, look at uh, Amazon, and and sort of try to give you a, a picture. Of course, then that's another product, another that piece an you're product adding to it. You're the, you're the owner of that application that looks at all your cloud resources, whereas a third-party monitoring company... It goes if we, from if a, we uh, stayed back with a typewriter and the old blueprint mimeograph machines, yeah. you know, that you had to hand Absolutely. drive, so they weren't connected to anything. It was from um, a pane of glass to a glass of paint. The, yeah, the, 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 problem of, the problem is just getting, getting I'm, stealing, I'm stealing that quote. I'm stealing that quote. I, I used to work for Xerox. So. Yeah. So the, the big thing is we just got to get, again, it's a change of mindset thing, that I think we really need to get away from the focus of the way to fix the security problem from a business point of view is bodies. I think now the um, way to fix it is bodies in some piece, some parts, but also third-party entities who are, you know, that's what they do. We're, we're putting $60,000. Yeah, okay, that's what we could pay for a low-end employee. All right, that's great. But we're going to put $60,000 in this company's pot because their job is going to be to take their group of people who do nothing but watch this type of log for these types of events, and we're going to pay them to keep their eyes on that information for us because that's they do it all the time. That's why is doing so well. Yeah. Yeah. well you know, and that's what so eleven employees you know, yeah. do. Yeah, Browse right. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's so really where we've got to get to. Yeah. But we've got to get C suite to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. But at the same time, you still don't, we've lost a, a good deal of people today. Don't have that deep Windows internals either. So the, right. the Linux internals is no different than the Windows internals on, on that um, experience level, skill level. I would almost say the opposite. Like, it seems a lot easier to go in and see what's going on in Linux if you know where to look. Windows, because like, it means a file. You can't see anything. Yeah, maybe it's look the whole at unit Microsoft is designed for transparency it's and also security, security control. Yeah. Whereas awesome. Windows was designed to have no security control and total visibility and uh, no visibility. Yeah. Windows was designed to have that one. Yep. Um. And take your money. <laughs> Yeah, so in that regard, yeah, they're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So we've covered everything that I wanted to cover in cloud discussions. Do you guys have anything else you want to drop in on? Uh, I'll just share a quick thing that I just dropped in our notes. Um, if anybody's interested as far as like AWS, uh, there's a tool out there, to, and I can share the link in the general chat. It's uh, There's a free tier. Uh, and a pay tier, but it's uh, Grey Hat Warfare, and it searches for all S3 buckets that are public. Um, and with that, you can actually go through every single public bucket and look at the data. You can, you can actually pull the data. <laughs> That's the other one, PACU. 
PSC, okay. Uh, they had this, uh, I took that uh, Black Hills bird to cloud pen testing thing back uh, okay. in 2020 or whatever. Yeah. The, the, their, their first test one or whatever. Uh, so it's just one day, but they had us use Paku against uh, AWS, and it was, it was quite fun. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was the same thing of like discovering S3 buckets. I hadn't used the one used. What was it called? Uh, Gray Hat Warfare. Gray Hat Warfare. Yep, I'll uh, post it. In. Yeah, CyberArk has one for doing the buckets on uh, Azure. I don't know if it does SharePoint to the. I wonder if you could crawl it. <laughs> I don't know. SharePoint links are like really using long. some names. Yeah. That's I don't know. Get a big enough computer. That is a good point, though, Eric. I hadn't really thought about crawling and looking for public SharePoints. Do they all have like a same? Oh yeah, so they're out there. It's not an MB5 hash, but he's right. But I mean, I guess I mean, was it, was it like that name then like SharePoint.com or something? Well, that's what I'm wondering. If you, at least it's some, some kind of indicator of your your domain, or some reference. I guess right. they can use some kind of Google Dork to yeah. basically find them. So uh, yeah, there might be something on the was it Google Hack Database, whatever mm -hmm. GHD or GHB. Sheila just said, wow, volunteer with the Red Cross bucket script on that huge SharePoint can be troublesome. That's just, absolutely. <laughs> Somebody have a field day. Uh, Luke, do you have anything you want to share? From a pen testing perspective, I don't, um, I don't deal with too many cloud providers and generally organizations that are throwing their stuff on the cloud asking us to test the infrastructure. We're testing the applications that are served on it. We're testing the file storage. In some cases, we're testing the, um, the SharePoint as well. Uh, I, I don't know if, from an offensive security perspective, if attacking cloud providers themselves is really going to lead anywhere. There are many terms of service that has been relaxed over the years where the cloud providers say, okay, if you're on our service, go ahead and test your own stuff. Just don't attack your neighbors. Don't attack the infrastructure. And, and most of our organizations get that. Uh, that's actually pretty recent. It's it's only um, shifted, the, the seas have shifted in the last couple of years, maybe three or four years or so, when this is now possible. Uh, I'm just wondering what, what this the future holds for testing and validating cloud provider infrastructure when an organization wants to put their critical data on it. I think in many of those cases, like, you know, I know with AWS, you have the GovCloud side, same thing with Microsoft. You're just going to have to be willing to take the money to go up to the more secure side of the public cloud if you're going to be putting critical data out there. Again, but a lot of people won't do it because it's a money thing. Exactly. You know, so, you know, it all comes back down again into those same arguments is, you know, you have to get people to understand you pay the importance, you take the the importance of the 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 hackers like I think choice. we're slowly getting people to realize how important data is. Slowly. But for a long time, you know, data, so what? You know, so they have my birth date, so they have my address, you know, so if they have the picture of my wife, you know, who cares? You know, but the issue's becoming because now it's becoming more it. important and they're and you don't anymore. Anymore. So. You've lost all that data. It's been encrypted. So you don't have any of that. It's gone. But all that stuff that you didn't care if somebody else had, well, that's one thing. But when you no longer have it, and you're talking about everything that runs your organization, including apparently but valuable. The, but those things are valuable. Oh, yes. hell yeah. It's, and so it's, but it's helping those people understand that what they have. Nobody is, sat down and, and said, this, this IT security is basically putting at risk all of the physical assets, all of the intellectual property, all of the data, all of the operations of my company. What's the value of that? That's what I say. What's yeah. the value of that? Well, and China, China's recognizing that, right? They're scarfing up as much as they possibly can consume. And even if they can not even decrypt it today, they're just scarfing up everything they can. Because the, the play is, maybe we'll figure something out with it. There's a on. Dilbert cartoon that says, I've lost all my data. It's OK. I've hacked the CIA. They've got a copy of it. I've got it back. <laughs> It's like, seriously, it's going to get to that point where, like, if you pay China a few thousand dollars, you can get your database back unencrypted because they've already taken a copy of it. I mean, you know. And as, as computing power goes up, <laughs> those encrypted files that today just doesn't make any sense to go after, that tomorrow, yeah. that may not be true anymore. The, the computing power may be such that, hey, I can, you know, I can run 15 billion 
combinations against it in an hour, you know, yeah, it, it won't make any difference anymore. So, I mean, that's going to be part of this is that some of these places are just harvesting stuff because at some point in time, they're assuming but how we're going to have the ability to get into it. At that point in time, right? Like, obviously, any financial aid is <coughs> Well, but yeah, even intellectual property, right? Hopefully, things have advanced enough by that time. That, yeah. that IP is not going to worth anything well, anymore. Well, I, and I got that, but I used the mass mailing example. How many of us get mail to tenants who lived in our houses 45 years ago, but we still get mail addressed to them because... It's just the fact that I'm sending out this email, right and you know. <laughs> so again, data is going to be the data is the same way. They don't care necessarily is the data good and valid. Plus one for that it's wedding. data. <laughs> I'm willing to pay for it. Yeah, I pay a reduced rate if it might might not be good, but who knows? I can send out this email to Joe Blow at wherever, and who knows that email just may show up on somebody's desk, and I can get them to click on it even if it isn't going to them. And that's all they care about. Is they just. They want the victims. So the more I send out, the more likely I am to have more victims. Numbers being. Yep. Yeah. It's like sales. So your original question was, what 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 level do companies feel safe putting their sensitive data in the cloud? Or my original question went back to testing and validating the security posture of an organization when they spin up a cloud service. Uh, yes. So I guess that is that a major deal? How does that look in the future from today through? So for Azure, at least, you, know, like you can have you can write policies saying all these configs should be set to this, and you can just keep adding to that. You add yeah, yes, that. Yes. And then so that when you deploy new service, it'll automatically check against all those configs you've already right. said should be set in a certain way. And you own that data, not the cloud provider. Are those configs trustworthy? Can they be broken? Well, they're not setting. They're just automatically. And so the question obviously, yeah, certain configs, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, like exactly. Obviously, there might be a config where, hey, this application can access this key vault, but this application can be exploited to then export the key from the key vault. Right. There's definitely ways of you know, that happening. But it's the, you know, from, from at least from my perspective for pen testing, it's, you know, can I find any side channel way in? Is there any other alternative access? Can you and, use a feature? Right, if you right. Exactly. Exactly. It's living off the land just in the cloud. Well, it's going to be a lot easier to just air. get the guy who you know forgot to turn SSL on. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so the cloud has so allowed us to eliminate that. This <laughs> person, somebody has to sit here and set this <laughs> server up, and then I have to sit here and set this server up, and then I have to sit here and set up this server. We can create these base configs, and every server that spins up is going to carry that base config, which. Sure makes it so you aren't as likely to have forgotten to turn this off or this on or whatever. So only with a pipe. But you're you're in there making changes, you could so. generate a security threat while you're making those changes, which can be yep. exploited just yep. during a development phase. Unless you just happen just to come across from the world world world. Yeah. On the instance, that shouldn't be yes. open. Your base config could be broken. Exactly. Yes. Because okay. somebody was lazy, they were tired, they were overworked. They were not being paid enough yep. because we have a shortage it's, of people. It's still the human in the factor. information security field because we don't have an education pipeline, because we don't have companies willing to pay enough, and all these problems are piled up in yes. where we are. All right. Well, good meeting, everybody. Thanks for joining Absolutely. everybody online. Cool.